Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Obi Dieng, Dr. Peter Obi. Dr. Peter Obi, please keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping. You are welcome, sir. Please be seated. I'm sure you have listened to the keynote. So I'm just going to be one of those who are going to discuss it. Let me, the Reverend Monsignor and the Reverend Fathers are here, the Reverend Sisters, very different, the VIPs, everybody, let me borrow that kind of Nigerian word, all protocols duly observed. Mine is, first, is most sincerely apologize that we came in here late. I was telling the chairman at the airport that it's God that made it possible that we are traveling together because as a politician, they wouldn't have believed me. If I had come and say it's police, it's like it's flight, they would say, ah, that's how they talk. But since chairman was involved, they would believe that it's flight through, through. You know? And somebody said, oh, they invited me months. There's no way I would have, I told father, there's no way I would have missed this event. Because the invitation came from a place where I cannot say no. If you know how I've invited for this occasion, this invitation came through my wife. And her question is, this is my parish. Let me not hear you anywhere that day. <laughs> Drops it. And this morning I had to engage, borrow for that judge to speak to her. And I'm running late. It's not me. You know, for that judge, please speak. I said, I would say, can't I pass through the house and have breakfast? Say, go there first. When you finish, you come home and eat. It's okay. So I thank you for the occasion. And I thank the organizers. And I thank for that judge for what you've done. Wonderful work. Whenever you sit down and reflect what is happening in Nigeria, the only thing you can feel is sad and pain. I was talking to Father George at the airport, and I told him, I said, I sat down yesterday with one of the people I consider very influential in the North. You know, and I showed him, I said, he's his friend, so he knows him very well. And I said, I, I said to him, let me come and see you. He said, no, Peter. I said, I'll come and see you. I want us to sit down and talk. And talk about Nigeria. And I went to his house and I want to read out. He tweeted it. And saw so some of those who followed tweet who know what's hidden. So after I visited him, see my phone acting funny now. And he, after I visited him, he tweeted, he said, I spent valuable time with Mr. Peter Obi this morning. I wish to, to those who see him as ethnic candidate to get to know him better. I also wish to those who try to sell him, tone down their ethnic identity. I hope this nation will see and listen to this candidate. Revolution is coming. Because I sat down to him, I said, listen. I told him, I said, you think this is issue of tribe or issue of religion? No. Can you show me the roads where that is paid for Muslims to drive through so I can pass through it? Can you show me where Muslims buy bread cheap? Can you show me those where there's so much no poverty for Muslims so we can go there and live? I said, the president is from Kastana. I visited Kasina. People were living in fear. Even more fear for them my state. So it is not issue of religion. It is not issue of tribe. That is what we politicians used to continue the confusion called Nigeria. There is no country in the world today, like Father George has said, who has this collection on who would be where we are that will not have the problems we're facing. We have over 100 million people living in poverty. From the World Bank report just released two weeks ago, 7 million will be added to it. So soon you have about 110 million living in poverty. There's no way you won't have problems. I say it every day. You have more people living in poverty than the two biggest countries of the world combined. China and India is 2.8 billion, 
but you have more people living in poverty than two of them combined, and you're just 200. There's no way you won't have crisis. We have the highest unemployment in the world, but you check the population. You have 35% unemployment combined by underemployment because so many people today, the income they earn cannot do anything for them. So you have underemployment of about 25%. That is 60% underemployment, out of which 70% are your young ones in their productive age doing nothing. We have the highest drug prevalence in the world today, 14.8, when the global average is 5.7. Young men using drugs in this country. You have to have crisis. There's no way. You won't have crisis. So that is the crisis you're facing and it's beginning. Because every day is getting worse. Businesses are collapsing. People don't know what to do. So the only thing they do is do something that is wrong. And nobody is doing anything. And your state is not working. Father George has just mentioned about what I was telling him about borrowing. I said, Father, you have reached a crisis situation that your country now borrows about a trillion every month to survive last year and i give you last in this year first five months of last year nigeria borrowed or their servicing total revenue from january to may was one trillion eight hundred and forty seven billion we used one trillion eight hundred and two to service debt that is ninety eight percent and we're borrowing more. By our last year budget, we promised that our borrowing will be 30%. We borrowed over 60. Assist. This year, our budget is about 18 trillion. Out of which we say we are going to borrow only 6 trillion. I can assure you there's no way we can generate more than 6 trillion. So we're going to borrow 12. And you're servicing that in the next one year, we will need to borrow, which is what we are doing today, because 100% of what we earn as revenue will not be enough to service our debts. Because the entire money you borrowed was for consumption. So there's no, there's no way it's generating anything. And that is the crisis you face as a nation. In the past one year, Nigeria has not put a penny into the sinking fund for payment. Even for the young ones. They don't even know that the bonds we're issuing today are payable in 2045, 50, 55. We'll soon be issuing bonds for 60. We will all be gone by then. It's their problem because, and we're not serving anything to pay it. And nobody's caring. Everybody is just moving. So Nigeria is just like I always say, it's Titanic. You know when Titanic was going under, the people on the deck where they play music was busy dancing and thinking that they are still there until everything went under that's what is happening in this country people are still going around as if things are normal it is not normal you cannot move around in nigeria today you can't go to from abuja to karuna by road by air by anything no way they'll tell you don't please don't come i was campaigning all over the north everywhere said, please peter don't come and people think it's normal it is not normal. You live in a country that is totally unproductive. Country that is totally unproductive. So when we talk about good governance, where do we start? We have to examine ourselves and say, what do we need as a country? How do we start? What are we going to do? First, is that your country is not productive. Every nation of the world that is making progress is productive. They're investing in the right areas that make production and everything possible. That's what I was telling Father George. I said, Father George, I was invited for this thing, but I didn't have the opportunity of reading what the topic is all about. And he said to me, this is the topic. I said, okay, fine. Since you're going to speak before me, maybe from what you say, I will be one of those who will analyze it. Your country is not productive. It is not working. 
And that is the biggest challenge. Because you're, you're, we are all here for consumption. We are here for celebration. We are, all we do is sharing. Nobody cares how we're going to do anything. And I gave him instances. I said, Father, since this is the topic, let me tell you what we need to do very quickly. Here we are. Our total export, including the oil you mentioned, that you soon go. Our total export last year was under $30 billion. A country of 200 million people. $30 billion. It's totally unacceptable. I've been going to countries. Morocco, with 36 million. Total export last year is over $50 billion. Vietnam, 100 million. Total export, $312 billion last year. Vietnam is occupying a total land space, 331,000 square kilometers, with 100 million population. So in terms of land space, they are one third of Nigeria. Nigeria is 923,000 square kilometers. They are 331. They are half of our population, they are 100. And their total export. Out of which, natural resources is less than 2%. What are they exporting? Manufactured goods. Vietnam is... First is electronics. Number two is clothing. $32 billion worth of clothing. That's what they expected, exported. To why is what we earn from oil? Number three is footwear. $23 billion and we couldn't more than what we earn from oil. And we have people here who can do all that. Nobody is doing anything. And we're moving. And so are so many other countries doing the same thing. Nigeria is not doing anything. I traveled everywhere in the north. Went to Niger State. Half of Niger State is occupied by terrorists. Call them because they call them bandits. Half of Niger State. Nothing is working in Niger State. And I asked the people of Niger State, you are sitting on 76.3 square kilometers of land. Fertile land, you can't feed yourself. You can't do anything. That shows how unproductive Nigeria is. Netherlands, with 33,000 square kilometers of land, did export of food items agricultural item, 125 billion dollars in one year. You can't feed yourself. Talk less of talk about export. I went to Taraba. If you go to Taraba and see the Mambila plateau, the sand, and everything, the vegetation and all that. And I asked the governor, you can do flour here. I told Father George, my interaction with the governor, you can do flour here. You can do coffee. You can do tea. But they are waiting to share it, to go and collect money. Kenya exported last year over five, half a billion dollars worth of flowers. I went to the field. I watched young girls and boys picking flowers. They are being paid the least salary, $100. Just picking flowers. I was in Ethiopia. The young men working in tea farms are paid about the same amount. Last year they exported 1.1 billion worth of tea. 1.1 billion dollars. African country. This is no longer Western country. With all the problem in Sierra Lanka, their tea export last year was 1.4 billion dollars. So these three items can give 3 billion dollars annually. If Taraba with 54.4 square kilometers decides to do it and earn 10%, 
is 300 million dollars which is almost twice their budget they're waiting to share from oil it's an unproductive country so you must move this country from consumption to production immediately and we have what it takes to do it we have the talent we are there to, we have the resources except like he said we have gangsters all over the place and when i say people say so stop using the word i say no nigeria is the case of it's not just political class it's the case of where lunatics took over the asylum they're running it in a gangster way everybody's guilty of it all of us here like i said i keep taking my reference to father george this morning say father george i've been a governor this is the only country that will celebrate criminality everybody including the church they're not exempted this is the only country you vote people to be in everybody knew he doesn't have a house in Ikoi. when we voted him in i was living in first Act when i became governor so everybody knew where i lived and suddenly he buys a mighty house in Ikoi, running into billions the Korea furnishes the everything and advise the church for housewarming. The church comes in, they are praying for him. We see him wherever he got to this thing, they want him to build more. <laughs> the people, the church people all over the place, waiting to eat and drink and are praising him. They know where the money came from. It's known to everybody. Because they're saying what the church, the role of the church. They know where the money came from. But instead of calling police and saying, this man has stolen our money, they are the ones celebrating it. This is the country where I was governor. You come late to church. Church. They go and keep an empty seat in front for somebody who is not in the church. The seat is empty. He comes in the middle of the church. He's walking to the front. Nobody cares. If possible, the priest will stop talking. And they welcoming him for coming late. And the church people will be clapping and calling him if he has nickname like me. Hey, this man came late. Let come and stay at the back. But we refuse to do it. I want to tell people, listen, you can't go in front because you're late. So when for that judge said about impunity, it is a place where impunity, rascality, and bad behavior have become a measure of success and power. You can't use it the wrong measure. This man came late. And we know he should, we have young ones growing up who are learning what this man is doing and think that is how to live. So you have to come late. This is what I was saying for that judge when he told me about this topic. I said, there's so many things you can stop. So if they have to push people for Peter to pass, that should have power. If they have even if it's old people, push them down. So the rascality is allowed. You are clean up. People say, come in front. No, you can't kill them. No, you're not part of, no. Governor, we don't want you to stay here. Oh, be told, come in front. Why will you go in front? You are killing where you're supposed to kill. These are little things that is missing here that makes our country the opposite of what it should be. Because of it, the man who steals your 80 billion, of course, it is better for him to steal it and settle those who will settle and go home. Do you know what it means? 80 billion. 80 billion by official area is 200 million dollars. You see people today sharing dollars in Nigeria. All over the place. And nobody's asking the question. In fact, everybody is keen to collect his own. 
Nobody is saying this thing we are doing. One of the greatest measure of your economic stability is your currency. Today, Nigeria has been dollarized. And Nigeria is celebrating those we voted into power who have no means of earning dollar. They cannot show us means of earning dollar. If you do that anywhere in the world, they will ask you to show evidence of your dollar earning in the past five years, including relevant taxes paid. But it was being shared in public. But we are arresting young boys who have laptop. But we have people who are shared, people who have we're asking people to pay 100 million naira, 40 million naira to buy form. In a country Nigerian per capita is 2,000. American per capita is 75,000. Because Nigerian economy, as you know, is $400 billion GDP. Versus American GDP of $22 trillion. Yet, you cannot pay $2,000 to buy form to contest the election in America. But they are charging you here in Nigeria $200,000 to buy from, to be governor. That's what Father is saying. You're owing lecturers. You're negotiating with bandits. You see governors going to negotiate with bandits. But they're not negotiating with lecturers. And everybody is keeping quiet. Because it's not important. The global average intake admission of higher school intakes is that eight percent in the western world is that eight nigeria is nine percent we're not even achieving a quarter of the global average and that's the problem because you don't care for those areas you need to care i thought i was talking about my trip to you I said father we're talking about power it's so difficult. All of you here, Nigerians, everybody in Nigeria knows the amount that is being generated. Everybody knows about national greed. Everybody knows everything about power. You don't hear it in any other country. You just put on your life and put off. But here, we know everything about the oppression. And yet, we don't have the power. This country used to generate in 19... In the 60s, over a thousand megawatts of electricity. In the 60s, the first time this country borrowed money was in 1964, when we borrowed money from World Bank, $82 million to build the Kainji Dam. You need to go and see the letter written by the Prime Minister and the reply of World Bank. That is going to build electricity to generate. 760 megawatts of electricity when Nigeria was probably 10% of its population today. Almost 60 years after, we can generate more than 4,000. The second biggest economy in Africa, South Africa, is generating 54,000. And you can generate four. And there are 60 million. The third biggest economy in Africa is generating 58,000, Egypt. I will just show him further again how I went to Egypt and what happened why I went to Egypt. I told him that he, even the next day I had to leave because they were telling me you stay and meet the president. Meet the president. I said, I didn't come to meet them. I have done what they In Egypt, at all times, they must hold 50% excess power to what they need in Egypt. It's there, it's recorded. Total need for power in Egypt is 30,000 megawatts. Total production is 58, but they must hold always 45,000. 
always going through the system from the plant to the companies that built it to every of the operation and everything that is happening and how it's detailed and how they're watching it and what is happening and you ask yourself what is wrong with here what did we do wrong you know is he prayers or do we go and hire native doctor what we are we going to do to solve this problem if they become, if we ever have to combine everything to get it right what are we going to what is wrong here what is shocking is that egypt built their power plant you can go and google photos of you who read three countries of the world built the fastest power plant in the past five years egypt vietnam and india that's why I decided to go to Egypt. Because they do the fastest one. They were able to double their power in five years from 20 megawatts to 50 something thousand. And what did they do? They said, they found out in their study that power was one of the causes, causes of call it revolution call it riot in 2012 2013 because small businesses have no power and they collapse and they join it so they decided we must get power so it became part of national security and they were doing it vietnam have doubled from 36 to 76 that's why they are doing manufacturing and you ask yourself, what is difficult? I went to the power companies that built it. From the companies that talk to the financiers. All of them are willing to do the same thing. And I asked all of the companies, because they are talking to Nigeria. I said, but I thought you were talking to Nigerian government. They told me they will be having a meeting with Nigerian government for the past three years. Every time they come, is a meeting. And they come and go. I'm telling you, this is me now. I'm telling They said, when they told us you were coming, we just received you because you said you want to know what we're doing. We cannot. They told me that in Egypt, it took them one month from beginning of the talk to conclusion of the talk. And the highest person in the land was involved. And his position is, tell me what you need i don't want to go via any company i want to deal with direct with you men in germany would you have this you have this you have this can you get this thing i'm going to give a sovereign guarantee no variation no nothing one month they said nigeria is meeting upon meeting committee upon committee and each of those committees do what they collect money <laughs> buy house nikoi and then invite us as church members. <laughs> and we said that the man is doing well. And one of us will agree. But there are people that can conclude. The real problem is all of us. It is time for all of us to decide that we must have a country. That we must take back our country. And I will start from recruitment process. Today, we have people who want to be president. We have people who want to be governors. Who want to be senators. Who want to be everything. It is time to start scrutinizing. This Mr. Obi, who is he? Don't say he's a Catholic. There's no Catholic in it. There's no church. There's no, I've not seen where Catholics buy bread cheaper. If you know where, show me. Neither have I seen where Pentecostals buy things cheaper. Buy rice, anything cheaper. So, let's remove church from it. The question is, Mr. Obi, don't look at his tribe. Those who think Peter Obi is contesting because of an Igbo man, an Igbo turn. There's no turn here. The turn here is who will fix this problem. Don't... It is not his turn. 
So, let's put Mr. B on the scale. Let's put Mr. B on the scale. Where is he coming from? This thing he's talking, because we have people who can speak good English here, yeah, and who can talk well. This thing he's talking, where did he do it before? Does he have this thing? Do we know him and everything? Let's interrogate even mothers, his family and everything. It's not enough to say the man is this, the man. Let's start from there. This man who says he's going to be governor. Don't look at what you're going to benefit. All of us have benefited. All of us are going down every day. Things are worsening every day. I know people who can't go to their village now. Yet they are big men in Lagos. No. You can't tell me that. If your territory has been taken away and you say you're a big man. Where? You're just waiting for, this, for them to come here and chase you out of here. Because that's where they go. They go from one territory to the other. If you think this place is safe today, quote me, it won't be safe next year. Because they capture this one, you run to this one, they capture it, one, they chase you away. So, let's ask ourselves a question. Let those who want to serve us now come and tell us what they want to do. It is not good to write uh, things in paper and share us and say you're doing this and everything. Let's engage them. The last people, we didn't engage them. So when we started saying, you said it, say, show me where I said it. No, no, no. Come and tell us what you want to do. Come and tell us how you're going to get the resources and what you want to do. It is not a difficult thing. We have borrowed money. Your country has borrowed in the past. When Obasanjo left government, it will shock you. Nigeria was owing only 3 trillion naira. 3 trillion naira. Today our debt is 60 trillion. Without anything to show for it. Of course, you saw the publication. You saw the publication they released. The publication says 41.9 trillion. They didn't include ways and means from Central Bank there. If they include 60 trillion, so your debt today is about 120 something billion dollars. 30 something percent of your GDP without anything to show for it. There's nothing wrong in borrowing. Every country of the world borrows. Not one country have I seen that is not borrowing. Everyone on each of them is owing a lot of money. We celebrate America. They are owing 100% of their GDP, almost. We celebrate. People refer to Singapore every day. Singapore debt to GDP is over 130%. Japan is 230. Everybody, even Norway, that have the highest sovereign wealth fund of 1.4 billion trillion dollars they're still owing 50 percent of their gdp but what you do with borrowing is what makes a difference that is why our service debt service to ratio to revenue is very high south africa is owing south african debt to gdp is over 75 percent but their debt servicing ratio to revenue is only 20 percent egypt is 40 percent but ours is 90 something percent because we threw away the money. Nobody can find where that money is. In fact, from my experience of what happened in Egypt, if we had spent out of $120 billion we are owing, if we had spent just $20 billion in power, we'll be generating about 30,000 megawatts. A quarter of what we have borrowed and thrown away. And I can show you countries that borrowed. Yes, I tried so cool. I was in Viet in uh, Bangladesh in 2008-2010. In 2010, Bangladesh GDP was 115 billion dollars. We are owing 36 billion dollars. Five between six and 45 billion dollars were their debt then. It was about 36%. It was $45 billion. That's what they were. Their per capita was $707. Nigeria then, our per capita was $2,250. 2010. 
Our GDP was 375. And our debt was less than 10%. So we're owing less than $30 billion in 2010. Today, Bangladesh GDP is $340 billion. Their per capita, have, which is tripled, their per capita is now 2050, which means it's tripled. Their debt is equally tripled. Their debt went down to about 114, 115. But because their GDP had grown higher, in percentage terms, it came down to about 32. But look at our own. Our debt had gone up to about 30% for about $30 billion 